All right, just to do a quick sound check here, we'll get started in about one minute. Okay, I think we will uh, go ahead and get started. If someone could just give me an affirmative. I see interpreter Stubbs there. It sounds like he can hear me. I can hear you, Nikki. Excellent. Thank you, Director Jepson. Um, thank you for joining us for this media briefing about COVID-19 vaccine in Idaho. My name is Nikki Forbingor, and I'm going to be moderating the briefing today. Um, I just want to let you all know that American Sign Language interpretation is available today. You can search for the window for interpreter stubs and you can hover over the three little dots to the right in the video window to lock the screen so it's always visible on your screen. For the briefing today, we'll start off with comments from Health and Welfare Director Dave Jepson, Public Health Administrator Elke Shaw Tulloch, and Deputy State Epidemiologist Dr. Katherine Turner before we open it up for vaccine-related questions from the media. State Epidemiologist Dr. Christine Hahn, Idaho Immunization Program Manager Sarah Leeds, and Dr. Christopher Ball, Chief of the Idaho Bureau of Laboratories, also will participate today. Please note that everyone should be muted unless they are speaking. And with that, I will turn it over to Director Jepson. Thank you, Nikki, and welcome everyone to this week's uh, press briefing. Um, the vaccine rollout continues to go very well in Idaho. We are so thankful to the enrolled COVID-19 vaccine providers who are working so hard to vaccinate those Idahoans who choose to get vaccinated. Just as a reminder, here is who, here is, who is eligible for vaccine right now. Uh, all previously approved priority groups, anyone 45 and older, people living in congregate settings, and anyone 16 to 44 with at least one medical condition. And as a reminder, on Monday, April 5th, anyone 16 or older who lives or works in Idaho will be eligible to get vaccinated. The data continues to confirm that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe and they are extremely good at preventing COVID-19. The COVID-19 vaccine is the best shot we have to keep our kids in the classroom, protect jobs, and save lives. Next week, the state will receive in total 82,190 first doses. This breaks down as 62,630 first doses coming directly to Idaho for distribution, as well as 19,560 first doses going directly to the Federal Retail Pharmacy Partnership again for a total of 82,190 first doses coming into the state. That's a significant increase, primarily driven by a large increase in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine becoming available. For those over 65 years old, 67.1% have received at least one shot. And for those 55 to 64, 38.3% have received at least one shot. So we're making very good progress in those groups that have been open for a while now. Over 100,000 Idahoans have signed up to get vaccinated using the statewide sign up tool. Uh, of these 100,000 people, a little over half have either been vaccinated or are in the process of being scheduled for a vaccine appointment by an enrolled COVID-19 vaccine provider. We expect the rest to be contacted soon by a provider, particularly now as more eligibility for more age groups is available. Uh, and those providers will reach out when they have available appointments. We've added some enhancements to the sign-up tool, including the ability for you to indicate that you are available for a same-day appointment uh, and made it easier for you to update your information. If you're interested in getting vaccinated, please go to covidvaccine.idaho.gov to sign up. 
process is fast and easy. In addition to vaccination, the other, the other best tools we have to protect against COVID-19 are to maintain physical distance, wear a mask, keep your hands clean, and stay home when you're sick. As you know, these COVID-19 press briefings have been focused on vaccine. Starting next week, we will broaden this weekly COVID-19 press briefing to be about any COVID-19 topic. And with that, I will hand it over to Elke. Great. Thank you very much, Director. Appreciate it. Um, and welcome everyone to the press briefing today. I have a, a couple of things I wanted to cover with you today, and then I will turn it over to Dr. Kathy Turner, uh, our state, state epidemiologist, to talk about vaccine breakthrough. So if you recall last week, we were asked a question about ways in which vaccine was being delivered and administered to people in Idaho beyond mobile vaccine clinics. And in response to this question, I queried the, all the local public health districts. And the following is a variety of ways in which vaccine is getting to people um, across the state or is being planned um, or considered. So there's a, a wide variety of mechanisms that are, are being done. Um, as we've talked about in the past, as we see um, more vaccine coming into the state, we know that we need to look at the delivery mechanism of vaccine a little bit differently to make sure that we can get vaccine to every part of Idaho. So some of the examples that we heard um, that are being considered or being conducted are to utilize strike teams with National Guard for homebound individuals, large employers, as well as long-term care facilities, utilizing pharmacies, fire and EMS for homebound individuals, utilizing clinical partners to conduct migrant housing clinics as well as clinics in large at large farms using open and closed points of distribution or pods for larger employers larger venues and in some cases the latinx population depending upon the district conducting drive-through clinics pairing clinical partners with organizations such as Meals on Wheels or other community partners to take vaccine to individuals, and establishing large vaccine administration sites at local malls, churches, um, organizations such as the Elks Lodge, um, county fairgrounds, and other community centers. So those are just a, a few examples of the types of mechanisms that are being deployed across the state to get vaccine to people and meet people where they are. Um, this is, of course, going to continue to evolve over time as new partnerships form and more novel solutions are, are developed. So we will keep you apprised of those over time. Uh, additionally, this week, as the director mentioned, people aged 16 and older with at least one medical condition are eligible for vaccine. We previously discussed in these briefings uh, whether or not 16 and 17 year olds need parental consent to receive a vaccine. In Idaho, minors must have consent from a parent or guardian to receive a vaccination unless the minor meets a statutory, statutory exemption or obtains court approval to provide their own consent. Vaccine providers or healthcare practitioners should consult with their legal counsel if they do not intend to require parental consent for minors. And really, the bottom line is that it's up to the healthcare provider to determine if the minor has the ability to consent to their own care. And just as a reminder, the Pfizer vaccine is the only vaccine that's available and currently approved uh, under emergency use authorization for people under the age of 18. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Turner. Thanks, Elke. Quick sound check. Good. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, what are known as vaccine breakthrough cases. And because no vaccine is 100% effective, we did expect that we would see some instances of people being exposed to the virus after um, being vaccinated and then test positive for the virus that causes COVID-19. So far, we have had 97 infections reported among people who have been fully vaccinated. And to put that number in context, these infections represent less than half a percentage of the roughly uh, 250,000 Idahoans who are now fully vaccinated. Half of these infections have been asymptomatic, meaning that the people who we talked to reported they had no symptoms 
and they were tested for reasons other than illness, um, maybe part of an ongoing testing at their workplace or because they were a uh, close contact to a known case and thought they should be tested. Among the people who did experience illness, 80% of them had either very mild symptoms, um, so this would be something similar to um, allergy symptoms or maybe a head cold, or they experienced moderate illness, so similar to flu-like symptoms in which most people feel really crummy for a couple of days and then, and then feel a little bit better. Unfortunately, there were three people who did require hospitalization for their illness. Um, these were folks that had pre-existing serious medical conditions that put them at very high risk for severe disease. So it's not surprising that they, they did have to stay in the hospital. Um, as far as the type of vaccine that has been received, 53% of the, of the 97 received the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and 47% received the Moderna vaccine. So it's, all, it's almost really close to 50-50. People who have received the one dose um, Janssen vaccine are just now coming up on that two weeks post vaccination, at which point they would be considered fully vaccinated. And so for that reason, um, we wouldn't have heard of anybody who had received that vaccine as of today. Uh, there have been three infections that have been identified as the B1.427 or 429, which is also known as the California variant. And that is the only variant that's been identified so far among the samples that have had um, genome sequencing performed. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Elke Shaltulik. Thanks, Nikki. Actually turning it over to Nikki. Okay, um, great. So, okay, so we'll now take vaccine-related questions from the media participants. Um, we're gonna answer as many questions as we can in the time we have available today. Most of you already know this, but please raise your hand in WebEx by selecting the hand icon in the lower right portion of your screen. You can also type your question into the chat area, which you can also access in that lower right part of your screen. When I say your name, please unmute yourself and then announce your name and media outlet before asking your question. And please remember to clear your hand when you're done. We will go, the first hand I saw today was from Audrey Dutton. Good afternoon. This is Audrey Dutton from the Idaho Capital Sun. Uh, back at work. <laughs> um, I am curious about the breakthrough cases. Um, uh, Dr. Turner, hoping that you can talk to us a little bit more about how um, how Idaho's compare with national numbers of breakthrough cases, and also wondering if each of these folks' samples have been sequenced. Um, to figure out if there are the variants. Hey, thanks, Audrey. Go ahead, Dr. Turner. Yeah, thanks, Audrey, um, and um, welcome in your new stint. Um, so, unfortunately, there isn't a ton of national data yet on vaccine breakthrough cases. They, uh, the CDC is collecting these data from um, all states and jurisdictions um, into a, a database, but not a lot has been released yet. Uh, so let me do some digging. I can certainly get back to you on that one. I will tell you that um, one of the main activities that we're doing when an investigation of, um, of a case of these is, is, is being conducted is to try to get those samples to um, the lab for sequencing. Um, and I, I don't want to get into the, all of the sort of um, pitfalls with um, sequencing um, samples, but not all of them have been able to be sequenced that we have received and some we haven't been able to get. But um, of the samples that we have received, we've had the three variants identified. Um, and um, we've gotten, I would say, probably close to 50% of them, um, you know, either on their way to the lab to be sequenced or have been sequenced. So um, it's, a, it's a lot of, um, uh, logistics to get those those specimens over to the lab to have them sequenced. And how quickly are you able to get them sequenced? Oh, any samples? Yeah, it's a great question. So it depends on um, where they're being sequenced. If they're being sequenced here, it can it can take um, upwards of two weeks. Okay. We'll move on to our next question, and that's going to come from Joe Paris. 
Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Joe Paris with KTVB. Um, going back to the vaccines for 16 and 17 year olds that was talked about in the opening statements. I'm curious, are Pfizer vaccines being collected or left behind for 16 and 17 year olds that want to get the vaccine or is it kind of first come first serve what's ever available? There's not a concentration on keeping vaccine supply just for 16 and 17 year olds. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, certainly our, our vaccine supply, as the director mentioned, is, is increasing. We expect even more increases over time. So I don't believe that we anticipate any issues with 16 and 17 year olds being able to find Pfizer vaccine uh, if and when they choose to get vaccinated. I'm, I am going to ask Sarah Leeds, who's on the, on the line as well, if she wants to make any additional comments. But um, we certainly will be, as we talked about in, in briefings past, we have through our new pre-registration tool, the ability to help direct um, uh, people to the vaccine, but we also um, you know, anticipate that we need to, to make sure that we make it very clear that Pfizer vaccine is the only vaccine that's available and that it's there when people need them. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Sarah weigh on this as well. Yeah, thank you, Elke. Mm -hmm. um, I think whether a provider with holds back some of their inventory for uh, 16 and 17 year olds will depend on whether they serve 16 and 17 year olds. Certainly, I would guess that family practice providers will probably allocate some or hold some while they see what the demand is among their patient population. But then there we, you know, if, if a provider does not typically serve uh, 16 and 17 year olds, they probably would not. So I think it'll depend on, on you know, what the provider's population um, that they serve. So, so kind of, it'll be a mixed bag um, and around the state. Thanks. Awesome. And I just wanted to clarify um, something that um, Audrey had asked about just a moment ago. Um, I know when there was reports of the variants um, evolving in Europe and now back into the United States, there was questions about how effective the vaccine would be a, against the base standard and the variants. And with these breakthrough cases, is there any evidence about the efficacy of the vaccines against the variants and the breakthroughs, or is it simply too early to tell? I know you mentioned there was those three uh, variants caught so far. I think so I'm going to ask either uh, Dr. Turner or Dr. Hahn if they want to address that. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah. Okay, this is Dr. Turner. So, um, Joe, um, so far evidence suggests that available vaccines are still effective against most variants. Um, of course, that could change if the virus um, continues to mutate. And I'll ask Dr. Hahn if she has anything to add there. No, you, you're absolutely right, Kathy. There, as, as I'm sure um, many of you are following in the news, there have been lab studies suggesting some decreased um, ability for antibodies to attach to some of these variant viruses, which is concerning. Uh, but the clinical data out there, the epi data saying, uh, confirming how well they work is still really a work in progress. Uh, but the message we keep hearing and from the scientists that are studying this is that uh, even if there's a reduced effectiveness of some of these vaccines, they're still well worth getting and are expected to be helpful. So stay tuned. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move on to our next question, which will come from Kyle Fondensteel. Thanks. Uh, this is Kyle from the Idaho Falls Post Register. Um, I wanted to talk about where we are in, in, uh, in, in vaccine distribution. I'm wondering when will supply exceed demand in Idaho and, and what will that look like? Well, um, I'm gonna pull the director in here as well to answer. Um, we uh, start out, uh, we certainly are seeing some of that in some parts of the state. We've talked about in the past um, that some of the demand has been dying down, but supply is continuing to increase. That's one of the reasons why we made some of those decisions about opening up um, as uh, to different population groups as quickly as we have. Um, what that will look like, I think you'll see, you know, more appointments that are available than we have people filling those appointments. 
So we want to do everything we can to make sure that we're making it very clear to all Idahoans who um, even live or work here who want the vaccine can get the vaccine. We want to be able to address their confidence in the vaccine, uh, help assure them that it's safe, uh, it's an effective way of helping to get us back to normal um, uh, with our pandemic situation. And so we we are, um, uh, as we, um, I guess it was not in this call, but it was in a different call. We talked about there are, there are new media and marketing campaigns that are um, have been launched already. We want to make sure that we are getting those messages out to the far reaches of the state to help people build that confidence. If they're thinking about it, if they're you know watching and waiting, trying to make those decisions. So um, driving that demand is going to be super important for us to be able to do. And I'm going to turn over to the director to see if he has anything else he wants to add. Thanks, so. you covered that very well. Uh, I would just, the only thing I would add is um, right now we see people coming to the vaccine. And once we get to the position, as, as, you, as I mentioned at the beginning of this call, we're now at almost uh, 83,000 first doses a week coming in the state. Uh, we'll soon be in a position where supply may exceed demand, maybe within the next four weeks or so. Uh, and when that happens, uh, you will, we will probably see a switch where we'll be moving to try to take this, you know, the vaccine to the people. Uh, and as you heard uh, Elke describe at the beginning of this press briefing, uh, the health districts and the, and the vaccine providers are already working on uh, a multitude of strategies of how they, uh, they take the vaccine to where the people are to make it really easy. Uh, we know there's two types of folks that will probably be last to get vaccinated. One is, um, I think I call them the busy parents, I might call them the busy people category that uh, are just have busy lives and will want, to, want it to be really convenient. Uh, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be really helpful, particularly if it's at a place where they frequent or a place that's uh, convenient for them. Uh, and then there's those that are waiting to see. Uh, and again, we want to make that particularly convenient at a healthcare setting, whether that's the doctor's office or the pharmacy. So I think we'll see a change in distribution strategy and, and a change in focus on getting the vac out, vaccine out to individuals. Okay, we will move on to our, our next question, um, and that will come from Rachel Cohen. Hi, this is Rachel Cohen from Boise State Public Radio. Um, I think this question might also be for Director Jepson. Um, so like you just mentioned, the state recently rolled out a campaign to encourage people to get the vaccine, which was based in, on, in part on a survey to find out, like you said, how many people were in that wait and see category. And I know nationally, we're seeing some of those opinions change over time. So I'm just curious if there's any formal follow-up plan to evaluate those efforts or to see if confidence among certain groups in Idaho has changed or um, yeah, basically how that will go over time. <clears throat> okay, I'll go ahead and take that one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Excellent question. Um, we do not have uh, a currently scheduled formal follow-up survey, uh, but we will be watching. The main call to action in those advertising uh, that advertising campaign is to sign up on the sign-up site. So we'll watch the number of sign-ups as an indication of how well it's working. Um, and we did do some follow-up testing of the ads themselves. Uh, just um, I won't get into the details of that, uh, but what we did see is uh, there is there. there continues to be a general trend with more and more people saying that they are going to get vaccinated. Um, and uh, we did when we tested those ads with um, those that were waiting and seeing found them to be quite effective. So uh, at some point we will go back into the market to uh, formally check and see where we are in terms of uh, where Idahoans are and what their feelings are towards the COVID-19 vaccine. But we don't currently have anything scheduled. We're going to let the campaign run for a little while, see how it, see how it goes, and then uh, probably drop back into the market to survey uh, consumers again. Okay, um, our next question will come from Shira Matsuzawa. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, Shira with KTVB here. I was just wondering, you know, the, the CDC recently announced that the two-dose COVID vaccines are 80% effective after one dose. Are you at all concerned that people might hear this and maybe skip out on that second dose, or have you been seeing this at all? Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm going to, I'll um, ask Dr. Hahn if she'll weigh in on this too, but certainly I think an, a, a key thing for us is for these two-dose vaccines is having the providers 
um, schedule those second dose appointments at the time of the first dose uh, to make sure that, that that action that a person needs to take is not hindered by anything. And so they've already got that game plan set out. We know it's important to be able to get that second dose um, administered. Um, in terms of um, what we're seeing on the national level or what we're hearing, I'm going to ask Dr. Hanish to weigh in on that. Yeah, certainly. Um, we, we are, uh, of course, concerned about that. Um, as our data has shown us over time it, that we are, you know, getting good, a lot of folks back for that second dose. We're very happy to hear that. But um, uh, we are, we are concerned about it, of course, and um, we are worried that people don't realize that even if the data looks pretty good, 80% sounds good, that it might wear off, you know, so much more quickly. So we just need to keep doing the messaging and the education. And, and um, you know, I know the providers are doing a great job with making sure that second dose is scheduled right away. You know, there are other, you know, things like that to try and encourage people to not just let that slip off their radar. <laughs> Sorry, okay. a quick follow-up. Um, I, I know you said that the data looks pretty promising. Um, do you have any numbers by chance, just maybe how many people are not returning for that second dose? I, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, I know. Oh, that's okay. I think we do have those, and uh, Sarah Leeds probably doesn't, like me, probably doesn't have it at the top of her head, but if if I'll, we can see if she does, and if if not, we can get that to you, because I know that we track that. Yeah, Dr. Han, this will have to be a follow up. I don't have that number at the top of my head or at the tip of my fingertips that I could find, um, but we can certainly do a follow up. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, Shira, we'll, we'll get that number for you and then I'll email it to you when we have it. Um, okay, so we will move on to our next question um, and that's gonna come from Melissa Davlin. Hi, I'm Melissa Davlin with Idaho Public Television. Uh, th this might be a question for either Elke or Sarah. And by the way, thank you so much for bringing the examples of the efforts that public health districts are, are doing to get people vaccinated. I was curious if the state is still tracking wasted doses. And if so, is that percentage still um, as low as it was early on in vaccine distribution? Yes, great question. And we love answering this, Melissa, um, because it is incredibly low still. And I, I know that Sarah can give you the more specifics. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this number as well. We are, and you know, we think that there may be more than this, but providers are required to report their doses in a federal system. And so right now, um, there are recorded 926 wasted doses, which is less than 0.1% of the total doses that have been delivered in Idaho. So that's, that's a really great um, wastage. Of course, we don't want any doses wasted, but, but we know that that's going to happen. It's, it's just it's the nature of, of administering vaccine. Um, but, but that number is a really good number. Uh, just a quick follow up. Um, does the state follow up with any of those providers and find out if there are some providers that are more likely to see, even if it's a very small number overall, uh, if there are providers that are more likely to have wasted doses or what the circumstances around that waste might have been? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there, there are a number of reasons why doses have to be recorded as wasted. Um, some of them are just, you know, they, they're they an open vial. There were not enough folks to administer the remaining doses in a vial. Um, some of them are once the vaccine is delivered to a provider, they when they unpack the vaccine from the shipping containers, they have to examine the box and the vaccine vials. And um, there may be a broken vial. Um, there may be... Um, the seal around it might not look right and, and, and an abundance of safety that vaccine needs to be reported as wastage instead of uh, using it if that seal isn't doesn't look look right. Um, and then just if there's leakage sometimes around the vial, uh, again, that would be in an abundance of caution, we would ask the provider not to use that vaccine um, if the seal isn't really holding securely. Um, and so, you know, any number, they might drop a vial by accident. So there's a lot of reasons. Um, yeah. 
Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, we'll go to our next question, which will come from Nicole Foy. Hi, uh, Nicole Foy from the Idaho Statesman. Um, forgive me, my internet is really bad today, so if I drop off, that's what's going on. Um, I, I'm wondering um, how, um, and this might be a question for several people, but um, how Idaho is doing with herd immunity, especially, and I'm curious if there's any um you know particular areas um of of hope i guess any regions that um you're you're noticing trends um just what what is the what does it look like for idaho right now that's a good question and um i'm going to see if dr hahn wants to take the lead in that and then we can pass that around as we need to yeah thank you okay i think the mm -hmm. other person might want to weigh in a little bit is kath is dr turner mm -hmm. um yeah uh we talk about this a lot in our EPI team. Um, we know that we are not close to herd immunity yet. We also know that herd immunity has not been fully defined. It isn't, of course, a, a like a crossing a finish line at a certain number, even though we, we'd like to, to try to make it that way. Um, that said, um, we are the best data that we do have, I, I've quoted this before, but uh, the best data we have that is timely there, CDC is doing a project looking at, um, um, trying to look at seropositivity across the country. And also I always look at our blood donor data, uh, which has stayed stable at around 25% the last few times I've, I've seen those reports. Um, so we know that we're nowhere near where we need to be, which is somewhere right now. You all have heard the estimates go from 70% several months ago to now closer to something like 85%, kind of depending on the, the variants and how truly how more infectious they might be. Um, so we know we're not anywhere near there yet, but we've had a lot of conversations in EPI about how are we going to um, track that and as we start getting close to it uh, because it might determine um, changes in behavior and so forth when we start realizing that we are truly at herd immunity. And by behavior, I mean we might be able to recommend, for example, a, a less social distancing, things like that. So Dr. Turner, I don't know if you have more that you wanted to add about that. Looks like she's still on mute, so I don't know if she's having trouble unmuting. I'm oh, having trouble goes. unmuting only because I forgot I was muted. So um, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. So um, nationally, the conversations are going on as well as in Idaho about how to calculate herd immunity and and what it means for um, for behaviors. Thank you, Kathy. Just to okay. uh, just to round out that we are not having this conversation in a vacuum because we don't want to decide herd immunity means X in Idaho and it means something else in Colorado or Utah. That doesn't make sense. So we are trying to stay very aligned with uh, the work that's going on nationally about this. Yeah, I'm seeing uh, the dreaded little uh, yellow icon for Dr. Turner's video screen. So she may be having some technical difficulties. Yes. Um, we'll go ahead and Let's see here. Our next question will come from uh, Ruth Brown. Hi there. This is Ruth Brown with Idaho Public Television. I uh, wanted to follow up on something Elkie mentioned in her opening statements regarding uh, juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping, could you explain to me what is the, um, I guess, general policy for providers if a 16 or 17 year old uh, wants the vaccine? Um, but of course their parent, their guardian may not necessarily agree with that. What is the general policy for providers? Well, the, the general recommendation from us is that they, the providers need to you know, work with their legal counsel, as I mentioned, and, and make that assessment themselves about, about whether or not a, a minor can consent on their own. Um, because it, it is a little, um, I guess, they're uh, complicated, I guess, in terms of what statute defines um, on how a child can uh, consent to their own health care. There are um, a couple of statutes that may apply um, or that minor, as I mentioned, could get a court order to be able to have that ability to do their consent for their own health care. But um, because of the way some of those are worded, the best option is for those healthcare providers to make that determination on their own. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing hands up. Um, it looks like we have a second round of questions. I'll just start at the top here uh, from some of these reporters. Uh, Shira, did you have another question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, so we've been hearing about like another wave or surge in cases happening in other states and from the CDC. Are you concerned that about that happening here? And what do you want folks to know? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And, and I think the overwhelming answer is yes. And as the director mentioned in the beginning of the call, you know, we're trying to keep today's really focused on vaccine. Um, and therefore, I will address your question with the, the importance of making sure that we get as many people vaccinated as possible in the state and addressing any concerns that they may have uh, regarding getting vaccinated. Um, but as we move forward with these press conferences starting next week, as the director said, we will be opening up to other topics as well. And I, I think it will be a great opportunity for us to really focus on, on what we're seeing across the state in terms of cases, but definitely keeping our eye on uh, slight increases that we're seeing in certain areas. Okay, we'll go to um, uh, another question from Audrey Dutton. Hi, I have actually um, two questions, but I'm hoping they'll be really quick. Uh, regarding the breakthrough cases, can you, do we know for sure that these folks were two weeks out from their last dose, or is it possible that they were infected prior to that fully immunized time? Yeah, so Audrey, this is um, Dr. Turner. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see anything. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Oh, okay. Thank oh, goodness. Whole question. Thank goodness. Okay, um, Audrey, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that we do is we actually um, look at the uh, vaccination record of each of these people and um, make sure that they meet our case definition, which is that that positive result, the specimen, was taken um, 14 or more days after they received their second dose of the vaccine, because all of these have received either the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine. Um, and so we actually validate that as part of um, the investigation so that we're classifying them appropriately. So so the, the short answer, that long answer to the short question is yes, um, we are sure that these are fully vaccinated people. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my other question is about um, long COVID and uh, the 50 to 80 percent number is higher than I've than I've seen before, um, but you know, I, also it can vary between you know very mild ongoing symptoms and very major ongoing symptoms. So, um, but my but what I'm wondering is one: how close are you being it to being able to formally gather data about long COVID in Idaho and relevant to vaccines? How um, how much do we know about how effective the vaccines have been in by whatever mechanism they use uh, in helping with long COVID in Idaho. LK, you're on mute. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hahn, while you're unmuted, why don't you sure. try to take that question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Long COVID or, you know, long haul COVID is certainly something we're very concerned about. Um, and I'll just say that um, as far as how is it going in Idaho with that, we do not yet have a mechanism for tracking long COVID. Now, that said, we do have all the information on the confirmed cases in Idaho. So the way we've handled situations like this in the past is we can, for example, send out voluntary surveys to people who we have and ask them to let us know. Um, there are things we can do to look at long-term consequences. We don't do it routinely for m most of our infectious diseases but we and other reportable diseases, but we have done it on occasion as sort of a voluntary follow-up survey. Um, that said, we do know from national studies, of course, just, you know, how how frequently it might be occurring. And definitions can vary as well, which I think is one reason why you see different numbers out there for how many people have persistent symptoms. It depends. I've seen many different studies uh, from different countries with, with different numbers. Um, 
we are very hopeful. Um, I, I don't know if you, I, I heard the story this morning on NPR about um, the, the growing evidence that some people uh, with long COVID appear to have improved symptoms after vaccination. Uh, but that this is a uh, an observational finding right now, um, you know, an anecdotal type reports, but there are enough of them uh, that researchers are very interested and there is going to be uh, research into this question in general. In Idaho, we don't have that information yet. I can say that personally, as I've been working in vaccination clinics, I have had several people come in and say that they are suffering from long COVID and are hopeful uh, that the vaccine will improve their symptoms because they've heard that anecdotally. Uh, but that said, we don't have uh, scientific data yet to know for sure. Uh, I'm very hopeful that would be great, great news for those folks if that indeed was the case. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question comes from Kyle Fondensteel. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to follow up on a question from Nicole Foy. She asked about areas uh, that are doing better in, in terms of achieving herd immunity. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you can speak to vaccine uptake rates and um, in, uh, in, in public health districts throughout Idaho. Are there ones that are doing better or ones that are doing worse? Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> we certainly can see, uh, and you can see on our coronavirus.idaho.gov site on our um, vaccine dashboard, certainly in our demographics section and our vaccine uptake um, tabs on there, you can see by county where you're seeing um, vaccine vaccination rates. Um, so certainly there are there are certain areas of the state that have higher um, uptake of vaccine uh, versus others, um, but it could also uh, we want that's why we want to be very cautious about um, making sure that we're doing everything we can um, to address that kind of flip in demand from being having vaccine available at sort of a static location to making sure that we're doing everything in our uh, ability to get vaccine out to people where they are because there could be a wide variety of um, barriers that affect people's ability to get to the vaccine. So um, while we know that there are some areas that have more hesitancy, uh, we, want, we, want, we want to also make sure we're balancing that with um, availability. So I'm going to see if the director has anything that he wants to add in on that since he's also been working, uh, looking at this very closely. Um, yeah, that's, we actually keep a very close eye on vaccine uptake rates. Um, in the initial phases, it was a little bit, it wasn't necessarily driven by population because it was really driven by the populations that were eligible, which are not evenly distributed across the state. Um, and we try to keep an eye particularly on rural versus uh, frontier versus uh, urban counties, uh, just to make sure that there's not a bias one way or the other. Um, and we certainly see um, some rural counties that are behind the state average, uh, but we also see rural counties that are very similar in geography, population, uh, et cetera, that are, are above the state average as well. Uh, and so we, we don't necessarily see a pattern as to what's driving the, the variance across the different counties. Um, we do see that in the frontier counties, they are getting vaccinated at the rate that we would expect, that rural counties are slightly behind what we would expect and urban counties are slightly ahead. Uh, but we don't necessarily see a clear reason what's driving that. So with that, that's actually why we've shifted to um, this forward-looking view of how do we get the vaccine to the folks, to, particularly in these rural counties. Uh, as you heard at the beginning, there's many strategies that the public health districts are driving and the, and the health and the vaccine providers themselves are driving to make sure we get vaccine out to those, particularly in the rural counties, and give them the opportunity if they choose to get vaccinated to do so. Um, so we'll kind of wait and see now that we get to the general population being open here uh, just in just a few days. Uh, that'll give us our first kind of unfettered view of what's happening across all the counties. Okay, I don't see any more hands and there are no questions in the chat. So with that, we will wrap it up for today. We are planning another media briefing um, about COVID-19, as the director and Elke both said, next week on April 6th, it'll be at 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, you can watch for those details on Monday. Thank you all for joining us today.